Truly decentralized internet. What does Web3 look like? Today, I want to welcome to Blockchain Week Day 2, Dominic Williams, founder and chief scientist at Definity Foundation. Welcome to the stage, Dominic. Hi, and uh, th thank you for having me. Hello, uh, Blockchain Week Australia. Um, good to be here with you virtually. Um, you guys are, are 10 hours ahead of me, so this is quite early. It's about 5 a.m. in the morning. Um, so I might be a little rambly and tired, but I hope I, I can talk for a while about things that interest you. Um, I've been asked to speak uh, on the topic of Web3, give a bit of background about myself and, and the Definity Foundation and the Internet Computer Project and, and so on. Um, and of course, I'm very pleased to talk about, you know, all, all these things. Um, firstly, uh, about me, I mean, I, I'm a serial entrepreneur, I'm what, what you call an engineering entrepreneur. So I'm very focused on um, the, the develop, development of new systems, services and products. And uh, I, I've sort of been working on building things now for, um, you know, a, a long time indeed. I've actually been um, coding for more than 40 years. So that's a shocking, it's a statistic that shocks me, that's for sure. Um, but I'm, I'm still here doing that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, um, actually slowly getting into more and more advanced um, things at my ripe old age. Um, so, um, you know, from sort of early 1990s onwards, I was always particularly interested in distributed systems. And, uh, you know, I was an early internet enthusiast um, playing around with the um, very, very first web browsers. I used to um, log into a VAX machine um, using X windows in, in order to play with the mosaic web browser. So uh, that was obviously <laughs> a very long time ago. And all of the lessons I learned building early systems for the internet um, it ended up, I think, um, leading me to um, blockchain. Um, but I have quite a sort of different perspective. And I, I want to explain where that came from. So the, the last um, sort of significant venture I did out, outside of blockchain was an MMO game called Fight My Monster. Fight My Monster, very silly name, as, as you might guess this MMO massively multiplayer online game was um, designed for, for, for kids mainly to, to, to play particularly I, mean, I think the, the demographic was about 80% boys in the age range sort of uh, eight, 8 to 12. Anyway, um, uh, the game grew to 3 million users. And uh, it had some pretty interesting demands and I, think I launched in end of 2010 and uh, it, it was built using um, a decentralized database called Cassandra and Cassandra was designed to make it very, very easy to scale um, data storage. And essentially you could just add nodes to your Cassandra cluster and um, make some changes to this uh, thing called the consistent hashing ring and it would just sort of redistribute your data and replicate it so you didn't have to worry um, about much at all you you know if you wanted to scale up the capacity of this decentralized database you just added nodes and uh, fight my monster um, was the first complex uh, production um, use of the Cassandra database. And in fact, a little known story is in, in, in 2011, um, actually it went wrong. It was still in beta. It went wrong and lost the data of, of about 800,000 users. And the then Cassandra team um, got, in, got involved and worked with, through the night with me and re recovered the data and everything continued. <laughs> um, luckily, data was um, held in a redundant way. 
And Fireman Monster also actually made use of a, a sort of horizontally scalable game server, which I developed myself called Starburst. And uh, it was very important because it um, got me back into theoretical computer science um, with a sort of specific focus on uh, dis distributed computing. And, you know, I I'm, I'm, did fairly well academically in computer science, won you know, a bunch of prizes at acad uh, undergraduate level and so on. And so this sort of, you know, s set me up um, really for, for blockchain. And, you know, Bit Bitcoin had been on the um, edge of my consciousness, but I've just been so busy um, focusing uh, on, on my various ventures that I hadn't really, really been able to give it the attention it deserved. Um, but I s sort of took notice in uh, April 2013 when, you know, Bitcoin went through one of its crazy rallies and um, I sort of revisited it. And actually in 1999, I had used a library from a guy um, called Wei Dai. It's still up there. It's called Crypto Plus Plus. The, the web page for Crypto Plus Plus is unchanged in, in over 20 years now. And on this web page for Crypto Plus Plus, there was a there was a uh, a link to a sort of um, sketch for a system called um, B Money. And you know, back in 1999, I'd read this and just not been able to make head or tail of it, but realized it was something very interesting. Um, Anyway, 2013, uh, Bitcoin sort of burst back onto the scene. Uh, it it managed, managed to pull my attention away from, from the things I was doing, working on at the time. Um, like many other people, I downloaded Satoshi's Bitcoin white paper and was absolutely blown away. Um, and, you know, like many others um, at the time, you know, first getting into uh, a blockchain, I very quickly came to the conclusion Bitcoin was going to be absolutely huge and, and world changing. But my, my perspective um, on blockchain was was a little bit different. Um, you know, at that time, I was based in Palo Alto. I'm in Zurich now, but I was based in Palo Alto back then, uh, which is you know the center of Silicon Valley, uh, part of the Bay Area in California, so 40 miles south of, of um, San Francisco. And so I brought uh my sort of more traditional entrepreneurial perspective uh, with me to, to to blockchain and um you know by the end of 2013 um i had this domain name gamecoin and i was uh, imagining a cryptocurrency that would enable people to carry value between computer games and i had this vision that um you know computer games such as the one you know I'd created um, provided virtual marketplaces for um, goods, you know things like suits of armor and weapons and anything else you can imagine, perhaps with a racing game of car, and they would allow um, users to buy and sell these virtual goods. Um, I suppose much in the manner of NFTs, and um, you know transport value that they'd accrue between games. I'm using this game coin cryptocurrency and you know of course i i realized that uh game coin would would require much faster finality than bitcoin and, and be able to process much higher numbers of transactions because uh gaming really is a you know un unique environment and um already um within this game fight my monster um you know, there were, which also had virtual goods and, and um, gold nuggets that you could use to um, buy things and, and which you'd receive from other users for these monsters you'd put available for sale. Um, was some, sometimes, you know, handling many, many transactions um, a second. And, uh, you know, if you multiplied that across lots and lots of different games, it was clear that either you needed much faster blockchain or 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 something like you know light lightning network um but of course lightning is pretty pretty complex to use you have to pre precharge your channels and things like that so and, and no one, of course light, lightning wasn't invented um at the end of 2013 either so 
you know, I started setting my sights on um, working out how, how blockchains um, could be, just, you know, created that would run run faster. Started off by looking at um, uh, an early proof of stake system called um, NXT. Um, delved into that and um, sort of found some uh, uh, sort of inconsistencies in the way it was designed and um, uh, kind of what I felt were obvious security security flaws and um, ban began trying to interact with the team and and um, in the end uh, anyway um, began. Uh, working full time on what's known as um, uh, the, the traditional Byzantine fault tolerant consensus protocols and studying them, and um, became focused on something called le uh, leader free, uh, fully asynchronous Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, um, which is a particular branch of um, uh, consensus protocols that don't depend on timing assumptions. And um, trying to combine um, and, and change existing protocols so that um, I, I could create a, a blockchain that could um, uh, process large numbers of, of transactions every second with very fast finality, um, which, which I thought should be in just a handful of, you know, should have a, you know, be in the ha handful of seconds. So I forget exactly. I, 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 2014, I was working on a um, project called Pebble. I pivoted later for reasons I'll explain. Um, I think it was like the finality would have been like three, three to five seconds. Anyway, my my you know my initial ideas for um, cryptocurrency are a bit different too. You know, I imagine not only a, a cryptocurrency that could uh, move value between different computer games, but one, for example, that could process um, uh, vast numbers of recurring transactions. And I had this idea that um, mass market social media could get rid of advertising or user by, by allowing users to configure these recurring cryptocurrency transactions. And, you know, I did the numbers, um, said, well, you know, um, Facebook has this many users, for example, and this proportion might choose to configure a recurring cryptocurrency transaction to get rid of advertising. And so this, this cryptocurrency I was designing, Pebble would, would need to um, process many hundreds of thousands of um, these transactions, um, these recurring cryptocurrency transactions a second. So, uh, you know, by the end of uh, 2014, I'd, I'd already been working um, in the field full time um, for, a, for a year. Um, back, back in the day, it, it was very difficult to convey these ideas to the kind of ideas I was working on to other people in, in the blockchain industry. Um, at that time, um, people just saw proof of work as the, the only way of possible way of doing things. And um, there was very little knowledge um, around the industry about um, traditional distributed computing math. And I remember, for example, in 2015, um, uh, going to the crypto finance conference in, in, in Barbados, financial cryptography conference, excuse me, in Barbados and going for a dinner with the, uh, I think it was the Bitcoin core team um, from, from Blockstream and talk, talking about some of the things I was working on. And actually none of them were even aware that, um, you know, distributed computing had this branch um, that, that produced and studied consensus protocols. People were very focused on proof of work. Of course, the situation is completely different now. But back in um, 2014, 2015, that was the, the situation. And it stayed stayed like that for some time. Anyway, um, you, you may wonder why on, on earth didn't I um, proceed with this project Pebble in 2014 after investing so much effort into it? And, and the answer is, um, I'd become enthralled with the Ethereum um, blockchain uh, project and um, was you know, spending a lot of time traveling the world um, to, to the sort of traveling circus associated with Ethereum. And during that time, I became 
uh, you know, I, I came across this concept of the world computer. And, um, you know, when I heard about this idea for a world computer, it really just hit me between the eyes for a, for a number of reasons. And I think I um, was more taken with this idea than other people um, in, in the Ethereum community for, um, for, for reasons I'll explain. And, you know, Ethereum had made this leap, you know, from Bitcoin, which really just, you know, hosts uh, tokens, which are carried by these things called UTXOs, um, uh, to which access can be governed with very simple scripts. It had made the leap from that um, to making um, the um, code the primary object. So, you know, on, on Bitcoin, um, you've, you've got these Bitcoin tokens to which access control scripts can be attached. And, you know, when, when the Bitcoin coins move, those access control scripts disappear. Um, what was the unique and inventive step with, with Ethereum was that in, instead of having coins at addresses, you now had um, code at addresses and the coins move between the code. And of course, um, the scripts became much more powerful and um, were now Turing complete. So you could create much more interesting things with it. So, um, you know, very clearly now with Ethereum, you could um, write tamper-proof unstoppable code that would live in, live in cyberspace or cipher space, um, depending what the terminology you prefer. And that was going to be a game changer because, um, you know, whereas with traditional crypto, um, you know, the coins themselves uh, live in this decentralized universe and you can have sovereignty over them. Um, actually, any kind of logic that you want to apply um, lives in the, in, in the centralized world. You know, Ethereum presented the possibility that you could lift system logic in, into cyberspace. Um, and I saw immediately that would be a game changer. But for me personally, you know, having been through the, the whole Internet thing, um, I saw the potential as being something much bigger. And, and I'll explain why. And I, I but very quickly saw and, of course, continue to believe. And I think have uh, the, the, the Definity Foundation team has um, taken the world much closer to, now to this, to, to realizing this vision. Um, that blockchain will become a new compute layer for humanity, um, upon which eventually absolutely everything will be built, um, such that you know blockchain becomes the new cloud. And in 2015, um, you know, I started using the um, phrase "definity." Um, for a project that was looking into, um, you know, pr new protocols and applied cryptography that could be used to, to, to create such a infinitely scalable blockchain. The word definity comes from decentralized infinity. It's just a concatenation. And, uh, you know, you can get it on the way back machine if you're interested, definity.io. Um, you know, the early website describes um, the vision for a, a blockchain ledger that's infinitely scalable and powerful and performant and efficient enough to, um, you know, host mass market internet services. And, you know, uh, the reason, um, there, there are a bunch of reasons why I, I think this is absolutely inevitable. The first just has to do with the internet itself. And this is, will help explain why the internet computer is called the internet computer. Um, you know, I'd, I'd seen, um, you know, I, I, how the internet had evolved into a, a sort of commercial um, uh, machine, you know, and, and engine of economic growth. And people, um, you know, people often forget that all of the benefits of the internet um, essentially derive from the fact that it's an open decentralized network. So first of all, that meant that 
the internet could could grow very rapidly because um you know anybody could participate in um adding backbone capacity or you know um uh, connectivity for users and businesses and you know i knew several people who created early isps internet service providers for example and i remember watching the growth of the internet and you know i forget the exact dates but in the sort of mid 1990s um i th th there are a lot of uh you know uh, sort of big tech corporations um that were proposing um a sort of different version of the internet that they somehow would run themselves and you know they they would uh, sell sell this line that they would create a sort of curated walled garden that would be much safer for users and so on and so forth i think microsoft proposed this idea of the information superhighway and you know lots of people were still using CompuServe and aol um but in the end of course the world preferred the internet because it wasn't curated and moreover it just became a much more exciting place and the reason it became a much more exciting place and a better um, thing to be part of was that it's permissionless. So, um, you know, you, you didn't need anyone's permission to build something cool and new on the Internet. And this is very important. So to understand why, you know, imagine um, that, you know, I, some, you know, some guy, Adam, was building a dating website. Dating websites were actually one of the first websites that were profitable early on. So this guy, Adam, builds a dating website. And let's say I'm an entrepreneur building a dating website too. Well, you know, on the internet, you know, I might have this competitor called Adam building a, web, a dating website who's taking some of my market share. But but I can't phone up the, the owner of the internet and say, hey, uh, Mr. Owner of the internet, I'll give you some stock in my company if you slow down um, in internet access to um, Adam's website over there. So the, the fact that there wasn't an owner of the internet um, and that it was open and permissionless created a kind of free market. And it was a free market that connected all of potentially eventually all of humanity and it created this sort of field of dreams and this sort of platform for inno innovation and entrepreneurialism and, um, of course, various social freedoms and, and, and so on. And just this massive engine f for growth. And um, to, today, you know, we, we take the Internet for granted. It's as, as important to us as, you know, ba basic utilities like like water. And, and in fact, you know, if, if, if the Internet goes out to our house um oftentimes we provide you know it's a, it's a worse situation for many of us than than if the water is interrupted because we can we know we can get get some bottled water but if there's no internet albeit now of course you've got you know mobile data which is much better but so um anyway you know the internet was is just this in, incredible thing and the problem of course was that you know the the design of the internet <clears throat> um, it only allows it really to play the role of, of a network that can connect everybody and everything. And the unfinished piece was that, um, y you know, the platform upon which people built had to be, uh, or, or rather was left to, to big corporations. And over time, economies of scale, you know, um, meant that there was huge consolidation. So, for example, you end up with these like, massive mega clouds like um, Amazon Web Services and Google, and that other, other platforms really um, w w were important because they sort of consolidated um, user relationships and user data. Um, yeah, think of Facebook. And for many younger people, um, the internet really, you know, became synonymous with, with these platforms. Um, you know, if you ask a kid, you know, what's the internet, they'll probably say, you know, YouTube, Instagram, Snapchat, that kind of thing, TikTok now, of course. Um, and that, that, that's not, you know, un undermines a lot of the 
benefits that the internet um, brought brought to the world. So when I saw that blockchain could host code, um, I immediately realized that this was a path, if you like, to finishing the internet project, to giving it um, the ability not only to connect everybody and everything, but to host all of the world's um, data and computation. And th that this could sort of provide the same kind of benefits that the, in the internet provided. Um, and ulti ultimately, you know, um, lead to a whole new wave of um, innovation and growth. But I also saw, in addition to that, that smart contracts, which, which run on, you know, smart contract code that runs on blockchains, had a number of um, very, very unique, but overwhelming advantages um, when compared to code, you know, traditional IT code. And I saw that um, if you could remove the disadvantages of smart contracts, which are essentially that, you know, blockchains aren't efficient, it's very expensive to run smart contract code, um, and they're not fast enough to, you know, for example, serve web and things like that. If you could remove all of these limitations, they would have some overwhelming advantages. And I'll, I'll just um, take you take you through them. I'm half asleep, I think there's six. <laughs> so try to remember them. The first is, is that, of course, smart contract software runs on a public network. And I would make the claim that if, if, you know, am, you know, if a blockchain provided, you know, essentially exactly the same functionality as Amazon Web Services, it doesn't and for good reasons, but just say it did. Um, you know, you know, when I say the, the same functionality, I also mean, of course, the same, same efficiency and things like that. Um, people would choose to build on the blockchain because they'd be building on um, public network. So the fact that smart contracts run on the public network is very important um, and will enable, uh, you know, a public compute layer to win out over um, a closed sort of proprietary monopolistic system for the same reasons that the internet, you know, um, easily beat out the likes of America Online and CompuServe and this idea of an information superhighway. So that was the first huge advantage. The second huge advantage is that smart contracts um, are tamper-proof. And that means that the blockchain guarantees that the code will all that when the user invokes code, the expected logic, the correct expect, expected logic is always run and it's always run against the correct expected data. Now, of course, your smart contract code can have errors in it. And um, that's, you know, how we, we had a, the first taste of that back in 2016 with the DAO. But um, n nonetheless, blockchain guarantees that it's the logic that you've, the smart contract author has written that's invoked and that it runs against the, the d data that's been previously stored and created by that logic. And you don't need a firewall. You don't need a firewall to um, protect uh, a smart contracts based system. And there are no firewalls surrounding the internet computer or Ethereum, say. And when you consider that uh, in, in 2022, the world's going to spend $172 billion on cybersecurity, it's clear why um, that's an advantage. Um, thirdly, of course, smart contracts are unstoppable. Um, so, you know, if you build a system with smart contracts, it keeps on sis ticking just like the internet um, itself. Smart contracts are composable, and this is very interesting. It's software, uh, smart contracts are both software and systems at the same time, and you can compose them to make bigger systems. Um, smart contracts allow you to process tokens, um, I, you know, value in the mode of data. And lastly, smart contracts provide for autonomous software, which means that you can create software that runs without a human owner or controller and perhaps can't be modified or can only be modified by a DAO. So to wrap up anyway, you know, uh, the Internet Computer Project 
um, aimed um, and aims to create a infinitely scalable blockchain um, that ultimately provides uh, people building on the blockchain with similar levels to similar levels of efficiency and performance to traditional IT. And uh, you know the Internet Computer Project actually is little in fact is supported by uh, the blockchain industry's biggest uh, R&D effort. It's been running for some years. We have sort of 260 people. Um, and including some very famous cryptographers and computer science researchers and engineers um, working on the internet computer. And, uh, you know, it does a lot of unique things. Smart contracts on the internet computer r can run in parallel. The internet computer network uh, really is infinitely scalable. Um, the cost of smart contract computation has come right down. Um, for example, um, you can store a phone photo on the internet computer for about 1.6 cents a year. Um, by contrast, to give you an idea of the magnitude of improvement, if you want to store a phone photo on the Solana blockchain, which is often touted as being extremely scalable and efficient, it'll cost you um, $2,666. So, uh, you know, it's, it's more than, than more than 150,000 times more expensive. So um, the internet computers, uh, you know, not as efficient as uh, traditional cloud, but it, it's now running smart contracts um, with efficiency in the same ballpark. And smart contracts on the internet computer can do things that they can't do on other blockchains, um, including directly serving HTTP. So you don't need to build on the cloud anymore. You can literally just build um, mass market uh, internet services directly on the blockchain, and they will directly interact with users um, using advanced cryptography that's completely transparent. And you can build systems on the internet computer uh, that users can interact with directly, um, you know, via interactive web experiences created um, by the smart contracts themselves. A lot of innovations uh, in, with things like reverse gas, which means users don't even need tokens to interact. And can authenticate using this protocol called Web Authn. So you, you know, the, for example, they can use the fingerprint sensor on their laptop, um, Face ID on a, on their phone, and so on. And uh, you know, we're we're seeing incredible adoption now. There's a very rapidly growing, uh, organically growing community of developers. Um, if you want to do Web three, there really is no substitute for the internet com computer today. If you want to create a mass market internet service that actually runs from the blockchain, not from Amazon Web Services, from the blockchain that runs under the control of a DAO, decentralized autonomous organization, for example. There is only one blockchain in the world today that can even begin to, to support the um, needs, needs of a system like that. So um, if you're interested in the evolution of the internet, in the evolution of blockchain um, and the future of compute and what um, you know, mass market internet services, the mass market internet services tomorrow might look like, um, I invite you to have a look at the uh, internet computer and, and maybe d download the SDK and try, try building something. All right, I think I've run out of time. People are signaling me, so I'm going <laughs> to wrap it up there. Um, uh, it's been good talking to you. I hope you lasted through this monologue. I made some sense. Um, all right. Uh, enjoy the rest rest of your conference.